Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me, Professor John Nolan, to work with you today to present information around nutrition for the eye as part of this COPE approved CEWIRE 2019 academic conference. Over the next 60 minutes, I'm very pleased to discuss with you the latest understanding with respect to nutrition for the eye and how nutrition not only impacts on eye health and function, but now the data that we have with respect to cognitive functions and brain health. Ultimately, I will want to help you understand how we can use nutrition in our clinical practice for the benefit of our patients. It is important to present all uh, financial disclosures given the educational nature of this conference and to do so I present here some of the commercial organisations that I would have from time to time supported with respect to again academic training on our research science. It is also however important to point out that all of the research conducted by my centre and my colleagues is conducted in a way that we have editorial control and scientific independence from any commercial organisation that have a conflicting interest in this area of research. So in short all the data that I'll be presenting today represents novel hypothesis, independent research examination and independent high impact published findings. Our centre is based in the southeast of Ireland, it's called the Nutrition Research Centre Ireland and over the last 18 years or so we have been able to develop a critical mass to allow us conduct research working with the brightest people in the world and with the best technology in the world so that we can study nutrition of the eye in, in real time that gives us data to help us understand how we should new, use nutrition for eye and brain health. The main learning objectives of this educational seminar are as follows. We are going to go through the background for nutrition of the eye and brain and what components of nutrition actually offer a potential solution to enhance function of eye health and brain health and importantly how we can perform with respect to these cognitive uh, abilities. Of course we must live and work in an evidence-based world so I'm going to go through some of the important peer-reviewed published findings within our field to give you the confidence to help you make a decision um, for recommendations for your patients in day-to-day -day clinical practice. So we begin with the background. One of the greatest success of our time is our growing and our ageing population. However, the ageing population therefore presents a massive challenge because we know that as we get older we can lose our function and eye function and brain function is absolutely um, paramount to this. So in other words, while it's a great success that we have a growing and an ageing population, the challenge for healthcare and healthcare providers is to use technologies and to use in our case nutritional technologies that allow us keep cells healthier for longer and functioning for longer because only if we can achieve this is aging really something that we can um, celebrate. To this point we now live in a world where we have much more older people than younger people and um, again this is a great success story but represents a major challenge and one that I'm sure you see day to day in your clinical work. Interestingly, with the aging and the growing population, we have these age-related chronic diseases associated with population growth, associated with life expectancy. And the challenge of two main ones re relates to dementia and in our case, our interest in age-related blindness, most notably age-related macular degeneration. To understand this, it's important to know that aging itself contributes to uh, degenerative diseases and associated chronic disorders. So why is all this happening? Well I believe all this is happening because of the connection between what we call oxidative stress, chronic inflammation and ultimately disease. So in other words oxidative stress which I'll explain in the common slides is almost like the precursor, the trigger to inflammation resulting in cells to die in our retina and in our brain and subsequently loss of function and loss of sight and brain function in these patients. So let's talk about oxidative stress. 
Oxidative stress simply refers to cell damage caused by unstable molecules in the body. These molecules are known as free radicals. In a normal cell, the cell is working healthily and it's not under attack by free radicals. But a cell that's attacked by free radicals will result with cell death associated oxidative stress. And you can see here the picture of the apple to just give you an idea of the power of oxidative stress. The reason why the apple goes discolored is because it's very quickly oxidized once it's exposed to, um, to air, in fact. And this happens inside our body with this process known as oxidative stress. So, and as I said, this is caused by free radicals. So therefore we must understand what is a free radical. A free radical is simply a molecule that's missing an electron in its outer pathway. So it's unstable. And what a free radical likes to do is likes to take an electron off a stable molecule. And remember, the retina is a primary place for this to happen because of our abundance of polyunsaturated fatty acids. And because, most importantly, we metabolize more oxygen at the retina than any other tissue in the body. So the retina is a very problematic place for this process of oxidative stress to take place and negatively impact on our healthy cells. So in summary, our normal healthy cells of vision are attacked by free radicals because these free radicals are produced because we metabolize more oxygen in the retina than any other tissue in the body. So remember this, oxidative stress is a normal process. It's the cost of doing business with life. It's the cost of metabolizing oxygen. So the question is, do we have sufficient antioxidant capacity to protect against this, which we'll discuss in the coming slides. And all this, as I said, is fine. It's quite normal. We're all exposed to oxidative stress throughout our lifetime as we metabolize oxygen. And how we defend against this is we have an inherent antioxidant defense mechanism. And when the balance of our antioxidant defense mechanism is in place, we're able to deal with the pro-oxidant negative free radical attack. But with age and with other stresses that which we'll discuss soon, and we can have an imbalance and this results in cell death and cell damage to the tissues, which we would otherwise um, need for our visual function. So it's a very bad thing to happen if we do not have sufficient antioxidants in our system. We're going to learn today about what antioxidants are very important for retinal health. This ultimately um, leads to a process known as inflammation. So it's the oxidative stress, these oxidative, these damaged cells cause an inflammation in the body, which simply is just the body's way to try and fix itself. And to do that, what the body does is it tries to um, provide blood and antioxidants to, to the cells that have been otherwise destroyed. And this is why we get, for example, with macular degeneration, the growth of unwanted blood vessels at those tissues that we otherwise use for vision. And so the body thinks it's helping the system by overproducing uh, these blood vessels to fix the problem of inflammation. But as in the case of macular degeneration, it is this process that is very detrimental to the patient. And this is where we develop end stage wet macular degeneration. So we end up with all these um, oxidative stress, damaged cells, and this inflammatory process now around that, which is, is truly um, difficult for, for, for the cells. So in summary, inflammation and oxidative stress are inextricably linked. And we, I believe that oxidative stress is actually the trigger to inflammation for all of these age-related chronic diseases. Let's now talk about age-related macular degeneration specifically. And here we can see a normal healthy macula, normal healthy retina, and in this beautiful scenario, we have perfect vision and we can appreciate um, lovely photographs such as grandkids or kids. With macular degeneration, our patients really suffer. And this is an extreme case where you have central, um, total central uh, macula is destroyed here with atrophy and cell damage. And here we can see that this patient has lost their central and their colored vision. This patient has lost their independence. They've lost their quality of life. And this patient is in, in big trouble with respect to their vision. So what do we know about age-related macular degeneration? Well, typically, how do we manage it? We unfortunately wait until it's in its late stage um, to try and do something with it. And the anti-VEGF therapy has been used over many years now with success, which is simply 
uh, injections that go into the eye to try and stop the growth of these unwanted blood vessels, which I've explained, these blood vessels are produced by the body to try and protect uh, the damage that has been caused um, at these cells. And while these treatment regimes of injections have been successful with respect to patients restoring vision or even improvements in vision, what we know in the background is that this disease continues to develop. And what we know with certainty is that the cost of this therapy um, is, is really, really expensive. We're looking at about $2,000 per patient, um, per injection, per eye, which can equate to about circa thirty or $40,000 over a 12-month period. So it's really not sustainable. And ultimately, in my view, I don't feel that it's fixing the problem at all. And are we doing anything? So this is end-stage macular degeneration. This patient has lost their vision. Equally here, and unfortunately, geographic atrophy, which is this dry form of the condition, um, patients lose their central vision and quality of life. But unfortunately, to this point, we have no active treatment for geographic, geographic atrophy. So what I believe is that we really must look at where the stage of the disease where age-related macular degeneration has not yet impacted greatly on visual function. And this is obviously at our early stages where doctors like yourself can, can, can view via fundus photography or slit lamp assessment and see the early stages of macular degeneration. And really we must be proactive at this stage with respect to lifestyle optimization, with respect to nutrition, which I'll come to in a while, um, if we're to have any impact on this horrible disease that is macular degeneration. And really, and what we're not doing is we must, even before this, we must look at individuals with high risk factors for macular degeneration. And we now know that those established risk factors, the ones that we have certainty that they are risk factors are age, cigarette smoking, family history and nutrition now has certainly moved in to an established risk factor for age-related macular degeneration, all the while being accounting for other factors that are important, such as light exposure, um, obesity, cardiovascular disease, um, diabetes and low macular pigment levels, which in part is connected, of course, to nutrition. So I'll explain each of these in, in detail in the coming slides. The point here being is that even if we are programmed to develop age-related macular degeneration at say, let's let's say here age 60, that my genes say, Professor Nolan, you're, you're programmed to develop macular degeneration at age 60. I have the opportunity to do one of two things. I can optimize my lifestyle. I can stop smoking. I can protect my eyes from sunlight and, and other lights that we are now exposed to in our environment. I can optimize the nutrition that's relevant to the eye. And what the data now shows is that if we achieve that, we can essentially push out the age at which I'm going to develop the condition. So even if I have the bad genes and I'm programmed to get the condition, if I do all the right things with respect to lifestyle and nutrition, the data now shows us we can push that out. And if you push a disease out long enough past um, how long you're going to live, it becomes an in insignificant problem. At the very least, this type of optimization is required if we're to retain function and keep our vision for longer periods of time into the aging population and for the aging population. So this is really, really important indeed. So Alzheimer's disease and age-related macular degeneration, remarkably, they have almost identical risk factors. And I truly believe from my studies that it, you know, all these age-related chronic disease ha are inextricably linked with respect to lifestyle, with respect to risk factors, and how we can optimize and, and protect against these conditions. So I really want to talk now about nutrition. So is this the solution for diseases like macular degeneration or Alzheimer's disease? I, I believe that there's no silver bullet, there's no <clears throat> quick fix for any of this, but absolutely, I believe nutrition forms part of a major solution for age-related macular degeneration and for Alzheimer's disease. But it's not okay just to recommend to patients that they have good nutrition. While this is good advice, the science has really taken us much further than that to this point. And what I mean by that is previous recommendations around a Mediterranean diet, for example, are quite useless to your patient in my view, because for a couple of reasons. Firstly, the patient will not uh, understand how to comply to such a diet. And thanks to technology now, we've been able to look at diets and dietary patterns such as the Mediterranean diet 
and identify the key components within those diets that are likely to exhibit um, protective and functional benefits for the tissues in question. In this case, we're interested in what nutrients are relevant to the retina. We know that when you look at fruits and vegetables, that any of these foods that have a lot of color represent foods that are good for us because these foods primarily contain antioxidants and particular nutrients called carotenoids, which I want to speak about today. These carotenoids are lutein, mesos.